immortality of Jesus. I don't follow. Masha, until that moment in history, Jesus was viewed by many of his followers as a mighty prophet, as a great and powerful man, but a man, nevertheless, immortal man. Not the son of God? Not even his nephew twice removed. God. Is his earliest followers considered him to be God? Well, what I argue in the book is that during his lifetime, Jesus himself didn't call himself God and didn't consider himself God, and that none of his disciples had any inkling at all that he was God. Uh, the way it works is that you, you do find Jesus calling himself God in the Gospel of John, our last Gospel. Jesus says things like, uh, before Abraham was, I am, and I and the Father are one, and if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. These are all statements that you find only in the Gospel of John, and that's striking because we have earlier Gospels and we have the writings of Paul and in none of them is there any indication that Jesus said such things about him. There are many ways to approach this question, but for the purposes of this short video, we will simply consider the teachings of the Apostle Paul on this question. Why start with Paul? Larry Hurtado explains it best. Pauline Christianity is the earliest form of the Christian movement, too which we have direct access from undisputed first-hand sources. As we shall see, Paul did not simply believe Jesus was God in some marginal, semi-divine sort of way. Rather he viewed him as the one God of Israel, the pre-existent creator of the universe. Let us consider just two examples, that show, that the highest of Christologies was present in our earliest sources. First, Consider Paul's language in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 5 to 6. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. At the heart of this statement given in the context of food offered to idols is Paul's concern to uphold monotheism. There is only one God, who is worthy to receive cultic worship, as opposed to the many false gods present in pagan worship. Indeed, it is widely recognized that Paul is clearly drawing upon the core monotheistic confession of ancient Israel, the Shema of Deuteronomy chapter 6-4. Hear, O Israel! The Lord our God, the Lord is one. What is noteworthy, however, is that Paul has now included the Lord Jesus Christ within the Shema, even using the same word Lord to describe him. Paul is not adding Jesus to the Godhead, as if there were now two gods, but rather he is including Jesus in the divine identity of Yahweh. This is confirmed by the fact that Paul attributes to Jesus the very same act of creation that he attributes to God through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Jesus is not the recipient of a creative act, but the one who performs the creative act. Thus, Bachem concludes, a higher Christology than Paul already expresses in 1 Corinthians chapter 8-6 is scarcely possible and is the common character of all New Testament Christology. The other passage, not surprisingly, is Philippians chapter 2 verses 6-11 one of the clearest and most profound declarations, that Jesus is Lord over all. Not only does Paul affirm the pre-existence and incarnation of Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, rather, he made himself nothing, by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. He describes the highest possible exaltation of Jesus that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This latter phrase draws explicitly on Isaiah 45 23, where, in the original context, Yahweh declares, Before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear, Paul takes their glory due to Yahweh alone, and applies it to Jesus showing that he considers the latter as fully part of the divine identity. Thus, 
Hurtado has observed that when Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 11 is viewed as a whole it describes the work of Christ in a narrative sequence, starting with his pre-existence, moving to his incarnation, then to his humiliation, and finally to his exaltation. What is particularly noteworthy about both of these passages is that scholars have argued that each of them reflect even earlier Christian tradition that significantly predates Paul's own letters. In the case of Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 11, it is widely regarded as an earlier Christological hymn that Paul adapted for use within this particular letter. Likewise, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 6 is considered to be one of the earliest creedal statements within the Pauline corpus. Thus, not only do these passages show that the Apostle Paul himself had a high Christology, but that this high Christology predates Paul, and appears in the very earliest layers of the Christian faith. Music